do you feel like you're missing out on the one thing that is holding you back from standing out as an oil painter? Whether you want to paint portraits or landscapes, still life or wildlife, that's what I'm here to help talk you through today. I'm really excited to be talking about this today and to share this painting along with this topic. See, I've been working really hard the past six months to implement the same step-by-step -step approach for being able to create the kind of work that you're really drawn to that I give my students. And the result is that I'm using a lot of techniques for this painting that are entirely unlike what I've been doing before in my channel. If you're curious what this actually looks like, Take a look back after you watch through this video at my old videos. Just go to my full video library and take a look at what I was doing a year ago or two years ago. The transition has been a gradual one, so this painting definitely has things in common with the videos that I've shared over the past couple of months, but this one is a real standout, so I'm super excited to be sharing this one with you all today. See, this painting is drier, the values are all lighter and more impressionistic, and the mark making is far looser. And that looseness combined with the dry paint texture just yields some really interesting overall textures in the piece that I'm really excited about and that I haven't really had in my work before. And the cool thing about this is that being able to play comfortably with this style made this painting really fun. Like, I wasn't concerned with the end result because I was honestly too busy just being in the moment with the painting, which is something I've really prioritized. And I bet that if you're watching this video, that's a priority for you too. So definitely stick around and I'm glad that you're watching. So in case you're curious, the reason I could not sweat about the final product is that I have talked to enough painters and seen how this plays out enough in my own work, in my own experience, to know the secret to making work that stands out, to making work that others are drawn to, to making work that you're proud of, and ultimately to making work that people want to buy. And here's the thing. It is not copying what's been successful for other painters. It's not having a big audience. It's not doing a 10K followers challenge on Instagram. It's not figuring out how to make what you see in your local gallery. And it is not trying out the latest trend that you saw an influencer use on social media. It's tapping into what you would be most excited about. First, I'm gonna go ahead and explain to you why that's true. And then I'm gonna break down how you can identify what you would be most excited about and break down the path to being able to make that kind of work. So first off, let's talk about why this works. Imagine you're a portrait painter, not professionally or anything, but when you look at the pieces you enjoy making the most, it is always paintings of people. But you tell yourself something most portrait artists do, which is no one will buy a portrait of someone they don't know because that's not something you see happening in galleries or in any of your friend's home or maybe even in your home. So you go back to your local gallery and say, well, if I want to make work, people will really respond to. I suppose it should look like this. And by the way, this can be true whether your goal is to sell or whether you simply want to make work that you and others will love, even if you don't want to go into business as an artist. So let's say you're in a touristy town. So what sells are local landscapes and wildlife paintings. So you put together a plan. You'll say you'll keep working on portraits to build some skills. And then when you're ready, you're going to change gears and you're going to start turning out wildlife paintings since that's what you know people around here respond to. The first thing that can happen here is that you don't really have a plan for how to use portraiture to build your painting skills. Simply saying that you'll put in the brush miles isn't going to cut it to really change and transform your painting practice. It has to be intentional. 
So unless you're already working at a professional level and you know that your work stands out, in which case you're probably not watching this video, <laughs> there are likely too many things your paintings are still missing and you haven't really done the work here to identify and clarify what those things are so that you can figure out how to build up those skills. So what this might look like in practice is maybe your portraits don't always nail the likeness or your brushwork feels overly tight and occasionally you might get some muddy paintings or drab color. Simply resolving to work on portraits doesn't give you a clear path to solving those problems that are coming up in your work. You need a way to check and intentionally hone your drawing skills, for instance. That's the thing that's going to help you to get that likeness over and over. You need to identify what brushwork you're drawn to and set up some exercises to practice building up the painting with exactly the kinds of marks that you want to make. You need to address the reason your color can wind up muddy or chalky and whether that comes down to reworking your color or drawing or marks too much so that you can avoid that problem in the future. And you'd also need to identify why you aren't getting the vibrant color you're aiming for and deliberately experiment with how to successfully push that color. As a result, the first problem we run into is that you probably don't actually get to the place you need to be before you switch gears to start making the wildlife paintings that you assume will be more marketable than your portraits. Then, however, we run into a new problem. While the core painting skills we need for every realistic subject are the same, and they break down to drawing, value, color, edges, and composition, with each subject comes its own unique learning curve. So master portrait artists know, for instance, that you don't wanna paint every line you see on someone's face. It will age them too much. Landscape painters know that you will need to push the atmosphere even in scenes where that atmosphere is really hard to see. And wildlife painters need to be familiar with animal anatomy to be able to capture what they're seeing with confidence and accuracy, especially when there's a little bit of ambiguity in what they're able to see from their reference. So suddenly, you not only have your old painting stumbling blocks standing in your way, you've introduced a whole lot of new ones that you don't have any practice with. And finally, the biggest issue here comes down to something that is hard to pin down, but that doesn't stop it from wreaking the most havoc, which is not being fully passionate about the work. So here's the thing, people can tell. People can tell in the work itself, and they can tell in how you talk about the work, which, by the way, is an essential part of selling something that's important to you. If you are head over heels in love with an idea for a painting, you will probably pour so much care into making it the best that you can. Sure, sometimes that care might teeter on perfectionism or overworking the piece, but usually it comes from a place of just getting lost in the work getting in the flow. And that's usually where our biggest breakthroughs come from. Not to mention, that's an experience that can really sustain us. Getting into flow is a great predictor of whether or not we'll come back to our painting practice again and again and avoid really common traps like burnout. If this is a new concept, I have a video on flow that I will link above for you to check out because this is a really underrated concept and something most painters could really benefit from understanding and prioritizing. But what happens if you don't love a piece enough to get into flow? I can actually imagine this in my whole body right now. I, I know what it feels like. In my personal work, it's usually the feeling that makes me take a piece off the easel and probably not ever return to it. This feeling of just immense frustration at the gap between where you are in a painting and what you think you need to do in order to feel proud of it. Another place this comes up a lot can be commissions. Um, because you, you know you have to finish the piece even if it feels like something isn't working. 
and that drive to finish the piece and really plunge yourself headfirst into bridging that gap, in that case, it's born out of anxiety and not flow. So you might have a commission deadline and you're just really frustrated with the piece. You aren't quite sure why, but you have to get this piece done in order to show it to the client. So you clear your schedule and you just chain yourself to the easel for the next week in order to get it done. And it's not exactly a fun experience. It's, it's typically one that is filled with a sense of like procrastination and anxiety. Um, and at the end of the day, that really comes from a place of having this disconnect between what you would be really excited to paint and what you actually are doing. I know this because I talk to artists every single week who feel stuck on projects for this exact reason. And the core cause of it comes from not creating work that is 100% aligned with what gets you excited. Now, before we go further, I want to address an objection that I hear come up a lot around this topic, which is, if I just make the weird niche stuff I'm into, no one but me is going to care about it. So this might take a little bit of extra effort to trust me on, but I have literally never seen that to be the case. And this is what I help artists with every single day. The only time I've seen anything come close is when an artist starts throwing ideas at a wall and picks something he maybe thinks is cool or would be fun to work on for a little while. Um, but thinking that something is a neat idea isn't the same thing as being truly passionate about it. This has to be more than a one-off I think this would be a fun way to get likes on Instagram, or I think this will sell at my pop-up show next month. It has to be something you're intrinsically drawn to. To give an example, one of my friends, Will Eskridge, he creates paintings of outcast animals, possums, raccoons, bats, snakes, basically animals that creep a lot of people out. But that's not all. In his paintings of them, he includes his favorite party foods, so pints of beer, pizza, cinnamon rolls, you name it. And his tribe of people, his collectors, love it. And they would never go to anyone else for this, because who else can you think of who does this? And Will didn't stumble into some magical untapped market. I, I want to let that sink in because it's really important. Like if you heard me say that and you're like, oh, that's like weird and interesting. Maybe I should try that. If that's what's running through your head, you have missed the point. So I, I really want to make this clear. The secret isn't for everyone on this channel watching to go out and start painting bears and pie. Will created demand for this because he loves it so much and creates work that conveys that. And he knows how to talk about that work so effectively that people realize that this is something they never knew they wanted. And that's what you have to do too. It doesn't have to be an out there concept. I mean, look at my work. I paint portraits of people and animals that focus on evocative light and brushwork. That's pretty tame, all things considered, and I'm sure there are a lot of painters who could describe their work in a similar way. But I love it. I love these kinds of paintings that I make. I can get on a YouTube video and geek out about how much I enjoyed learning how to take the reference for this painting that you're watching me make right now and push it into a high key, or how I've been practicing a much more gestural approach to blocking in my drawing and mark making throughout the painting. And I've just been really excited about it. it it's unlocked a whole new way of working for me and it helps me tap into loving the process that much more. I love that stuff and I can really geek out about it. And that's what makes this work special. 
Okay, so we've talked about what helps you to stand out as an artist and this idea of creating work that you're intrinsically drawn to. So how do you get there? How do you create that work? If you haven't already gotten clarity on exactly what your niche is as a painter, what I find works best is creating a visual guide, an inspiration board that maps out all of your favorite paintings that you want to have influencing your work. And unless you are already creating paintings in this niche, in my experience, everyone can stand to benefit significantly from this. So even if you can describe your niche fairly well, or to put other words to it, if you can describe what you're passionate about making fairly well, there are still very real benefits from doing this exercise and being able to see all of your influences in one place. Because suddenly, you learn things about the color and light that you see over and over in your favorite paintings, or what marks you do and don't need to practice for your own work, or what similarities there are in composition so that you know how to confidently plan original paintings that perfectly align with what speaks to you aesthetically. There's a lot of ways you can do this, but my favorite is to use Pinterest. I can easily grab images of my favorite paintings throughout the web or even on my computer. I can put them all in one place and I can scroll through and see them all very clearly all in one go. And I look at this inspiration board before the start of every painting I make. So when I say that this is helpful throughout your entire journey and chances are this is going to benefit you, this is something that is still very much benefiting me. So the result is that I don't go into a painting thinking about, okay, I'm gonna make an expressive a la prima portrait. Instead, I can look at this collection of paintings and I can see the patterns and trends across a number of artists. I can look at the qualities of the composition, the lighting, the color harmony, the edges, the brushwork, the value structure, and I can figure out exactly what speaks to me and I can refine my own game plan based on that so that I can more successfully capture what I love about the paintings that I'm inspired by. I can also see how my favorite painters solve problems that I'm likely to encounter in my own work and I can plan out the best way to improve my skills. And this isn't just a quick tip or suggestion. I help every painter I work with to complete this exercise. And I hear time and time again, just how big of a deal and how transformative having this exercise completed is. So if you wanna learn exactly how to create your own and see exactly what my inspiration board looks like, you'll wanna stick around for what I have to share next. If you want to hear an even deeper dive of what this full process looks like step-by-step, I have a one hour masterclass that is free and it is linked in the description. So make sure to check out the link that's in there if you haven't already. All right, that's it for me this week. Until the next one, happy painting. Nothing like paint on camera. Oh, I hope this footage is fine. <laughs>